Well, I think the exhibition asks how specific digital technologies change the practice of architecture. Um, my own research has asked how specific te technolo digital technologies and gaming platforms uh, influence both fan creative practice and contemporary art practice. So we've been asking kind of the same questions, but in very different ways, I think, or at least with different different practices, but similar questions as to the role of digital technology. So for me, um, there's three primary questions that sort of emerged both through my own work um, and encountering the exhibition. And the first one is, how do these specific forms of, uh, of digital media or digital platforms um, shape and influence the work that's created through them? Uh, the second is, what are the challenges which emerge in archiving and exhibiting these, these platforms, the work on these platforms, which Fabrizio also mentioned? And the third is, how do we sort of frame these works either historically or historiographically in relation to other platform or medium specific practices? So how can we take our own research in these areas and connect them to other fields? I think that's a really interesting question. Uh, so tonight, um, professors uh, Terrian and Lassard will address these questions by discussing medium and platform specific works uh, related to both gaming culture and the exhibition. Um, Carl's going to begin with a discussion of FMV games through the Ludus Cine project, and uh, Jonathan is going to talk about the demo scene. And one of the reasons that I chose um, these specific works is because chronologically they actually line up in a very interesting way with the emergence of digital architectural practices. So we're talking about a time period this sort of roughly mid to late 80s to like early to mid 90s. Um, and so what, what we see are different articulations of digital practices in a very sort of similar kind of decade, half decade, with some interesting overlap there. So um, both both uh, Carl and Jonathan are going to present and then we will have a, a Q&A, um, which will be open to all. Um, I will be furiously writing notes for questions as well during the course of the presentations but I'm going to hand the floor over to Carla. Thank you, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I'm thinking that it would be best to start uh, this uh, particular talk with a demonstration through an emulator of the Dune uh, CD-ROM game. <laughs> talking about full motion video into games. Um, full motion video into games is the, a delicate time, as many of you will know. It's a landmark episode in uh, the history of video games, roughly from 92 to 98, uh, based on this technology, a full motion video technology, and it's uh, deeply uh, linked to the dream of interactive cinema. Of course, the dream of interactive cinema is uh, something that occurred outside of uh, the video game industry also. Uh, and this is partially what I studied with my colleagues from Louis Ciné, uh, supervised by Bernard Perron. Uh, we can find many precursors, both in the theater, uh, This is a Man in His World, which was uh, uh, exhibited at uh, the Expo 67 in Montreal. So basically the audience could vote uh, to select the, the, the next the course of events of the film. Uh, we have many precursors also in uh, the realm of uh, media art. Uh, for instance, uh, Lorna, which is a laser, laser disc installation by uh, Lynn Urshan-Lewison. 
uh, and using the ability of LaserDisc readers to randomly access the content of the disc, you could create an interactive encounter with this mediated character called Lorna. So this is another uh, form of uh, exploration of the, the, the dream of interactive cinema. As I said, this is what we studied uh, with Lutis Disney, and I invite you to go visit the, the databases at the website. So we divided the, the study uh, between these three categories, either uh, exhi mode of exhibition in a theater, in a museum through uh, different artists, or in uh, through the context of the video game industry. And as you can see, uh, video games, or what Bernard Perron has called movie games, is the dominant uh, form. There were, there were a lot of movie games produced, which is to say games that use full motion video, but also have obviously a very uh, game-like features. Um, we're going to be talking about that uh, in more depth today. Um, the dream of interactive cinema uh, didn't need the CD-ROM to start occurring. Uh, even when we only had diskettes with uh, very little amounts of information, like uh, on the Amiga you could only had 880 kilobytes of information per diskette, uh, we were able to have full motion video, uh, such as in this demo. Uh, that was circulated uh, widely in the community back then. It started in 87 and then 89. The New Tech Corporation wanted to sell uh, sell software, basically, to create these, um, to focus on full motion video and integrate it in production. Uh, they were the producers of the Video Toaster, which was uh, an interface designed for broadcast TV, and they were widely popular. Um, and they showcased the abilities of the Amiga computer. As you can see, uh, the color depth is pretty interesting. The resolution is standard for the time, 320 by 200. Uh, so even on this sketch, we were able to do full motion video. Uh, on the PC, Access uh, Software is probably the company that was most dedicated to bringing uh, live action uh, full motion video to its games. Uh, in the introduction of Prime Wave, for instance, you have, this an you have these animated clips uh, that, uh, again, are only standing on diskettes, very limited in size. But of course, the explosion came with the CD-ROM format. Uh, why? Because we went from, uh, let's say, Super Famicom or Super Nintendo cartridges, which at the best could hold six megabytes of data, to uh, the CD-ROM, which could hold at first 650 megabytes, up to 700 megabytes, so it's more than 100 times more. And uh, it created a lot of pressure on the developers to fill that uh, storage space. So what is full motion video exactly? Because th that's not as clear as it might seem uh, when we say that expression. Uh, it's an animated sequence uh, that we know as much. It, it's often associated with full screen, but as we'll see today, it's rarely the case. It's rarely been implemented in full screen in video games. Uh, what we can say for sure, it's an uh, animated sequence encapsulated in a digital format. So there's an algorithm that encodes and decodes the file uh, for playback. Uh, that's full motion video in a nutshell. Why full motion? Uh, when there was a man in his world at Expo 67, they didn't say, oh, that's full motion cinema. When Lorna was exhibited in a uh, museum space, they didn't say that's full motion laser disc. So why do we say full motion video? How can we explain that very expression? Um, I, that, I thought that was interesting to, to find out. I'm not sure when the expression appeared, but we can make this hypothesis about why we use that expression. Um, in 2D and 3D game engines, the visual signature, the VS right there, visual signature could be said to be very homogeneous. I don't think I have to explain this aspect for a long time. Uh, if you look at this screenshot, you immediately, immediately see the repetition of tiles and of sprites. It's the visual signature, again, of many 2D engines of the time, which were the norm. The advantage, of course, of these game engines is that true segmentation of the tiles of the sprite, you can adapt more easily to the input of the player, because you can process these segments independently. Full motion video, as a visual signature, that's much different. It's natural, quote. The quotes are very important, of course. Uh, every part of the image can move and can, uh, be, uh, uh, can be animated differently. And that's probably why we call it full motion, which seems like a repetition, but it is full motion video for that very reason, by comparison to uh, the game engines that were the norm. The drawback, though, is that these video capsule, as I've said, these animations are encapsulated in a file. They are very heavy for the systems of the time, and they are inflexible, so they cannot as easily adapt to the input of the user. 
Uh, I'm going for uh, the rest of the, the talk to just address two points. First of all, a full motion video is a mess. It's nowhere near as monolithic as the expression full motion video would seem to imply. It varies greatly across different platforms. And second of all, uh, preserving a full motion video makes it even messier. So there's an old, a, a whole other layer of mediation added when you try to archive and, or emulate full motion video that uh, will expose. Uh, when I say full motion video is a mess, what I mean is that there's a great disparity in execution. You cannot say there was one standard, one codec to encode all these video files and then display them on the systems. When the first CD-ROM uh, add-ons appeared for the TurboGrafx-16 or PC Engine CD-ROM, uh, for instance, these systems were able to display many colors on screen. You can display close to 512 colors on the screen for the, the NEC PC Engine. You have a decent resolution for the time, it's pretty standard. Uh, what you don't have is a lot of uh, working memory or video RAM. And that means that you have to limit the amount of information that circulates through the system all the way to the screen. So even if you can display 512 colors, you'd be hard pressed to find more than eight colors on that screenshot. That's it came from the desert. It's an FMV adaptation of a classic Cinemaware game. It completely killed Cinemaware. They, they had a big budget to shoot additional video for the release on the PC Engine CD. It bombed completely because there was barely any interactivity. But the point here is that uh, even though your system can display in many colors, uh, they have to make cutbacks because of the working RAM, the, the working memory, in order to be able to display these digital files on the screen. The same can be said about the Sega CD. The Sega CD actually had more restrictions in terms of on-screen colors than the PC Engine. Uh, and even if it didn't, the uh, working memory is so low that you couldn't uh, possibly do something much better than this. This is, of course, the infamous Night Trap that you probably have heard of. And this is the infamous shocking scene uh, that, uh, you know, where American senators thought that your goal was to kill the girl where you're trying to save the girl. That's a different story. The point here is that if you look closely, well, like I said, full screen, that's, mm, that's not even half the screen right there. That's because we need to limit the size of the file that's streamed from the CD to the screen. If we zoom in on that um, particular uh, full motion video, we see so many artifacts. It's actually a very interesting piece to analyze in terms of technological uh, layers and artifacts. It, you can barely recognize the live action source in that screenshot from the, the game, but it was shot on film by Tom Zito and his crew. It, it, it comes from a, a filmic source, it's 24 frames per second, which is not on the Sega CD. It's using barely 16 colors, and it's using this technique called dithering to simulate a, a deeper color deck, but it's not more than 16 colors on the screen. So, the Sega CD, that's its typical look, that's its, its visual signature, because it didn't have a lot of working memory, and so it couldn't uh, produce, it couldn't handle files that were bigger. We saw this disparity, disparity in execution even in the single game, as you've noticed in the Dune uh, demo I did at the beginning. Uh, the travel sequences are nearly full screen, full motion video, and about maybe 10 to 12 images per second, their full resolution, full 256 color palette, because the PC VGA card was able to handle such uh, specifications, of course. And uh, when the game was released at around 93, the average rig, I'd say, maybe Jonathan will be able to correct me on this, but it was about maybe four megabytes of RAM, depending on the system. Um, and so you would need a RAM to be able to stream properly uh, the video files. But then it becomes weird when you go to the actual digitized version of David Lynch's movie. Uh, it's not the same standard at all. Actually, they're pre pretty much keeping half the pixels in there. And the reason for that is probably because they wanted to keep the game to one CD. So again, disparity in execution because there's a, a production constraint here. We don't want to produce the game on more than one CD, so we need to make drawbacks and cutbacks where we can. PC technology evolved so fast and it continues to do so, and in the 90s, it was moving very fast. Uh, when the Visa standard came, it's kind of super VGA standard. Resolution uh, cred credible, it was four times as, as pixels on the screen, still 256 colors. 
Uh, what's interesting is that in many games, the full motion video is actually just a few cutouts on the screen. On this screenshot, only the characters will move. The, the, the background is completely still. It's a still image. Why? Because we're trying to save memory. We're trying to, ma to handle the RAM that we have available at that time. And the game already has four CDs with these kinds of, uh, of cutbacks. So you can imagine if it was indeed full motion video, how many uh, CDs we would have needed to, to manipulate throughout our experience. Full screen, full motion video was so rare that in 1996, a full four years after the phenomenon of FMV games exploded, uh, Ripper used it as a marketing ploy. They said, look, we have full screen, full motion video. So it was a feature in 1996, and basically what you needed for that is 8 megabytes of RAM. The game came on six CDs. And interestingly, when you went to full screen, full motion video, yes, that's a famous actor, uh, you would revert it back to 320 by 200, uh, even though most of the game was in 640 by 400 pixels. Why? Because again, we needed to compress the images to be able to handle uh, these heavy, heavy files. What you maybe don't see as much in the back is that the 256 colors uh, limitation of uh, a simultaneous on-screen color is not enough to handle skin tones very, very good. And the codec is actually probably compressing the image even more to be able to keep the file size very small. So to sum up this part of my talk, um, we can say that uh, FMV is a mess because uh, it's so uh, it's all over the place in terms of execution. There's production constraints. Maybe you want to keep your uh, game on one CD. Maybe you have only diskettes. There's a storage. How much, how much CDs do you actually have? How much uh, storage, support, uh, storage space you actually have? But as I've tried to show, the RAM of the system and the other visual specifications also play a big part in how this full motion video will actually look on the screen. And so. To talk about full motion video is not to talk about one object, it's to talk about an object that's actually as uh, diverse as the amount, of the, the amount of studios who produce FMV games. Many studios develop their own, or, uh, their own uh, codecs to do full motion videos. So we're not talking about one technology, we're talking about many, many different technologies with different artifacts. The second point I want to make is that um, preserving FMVs, as I said, is bringing a whole new layer of complication to uh, the table. Um, if in emulating games through DOSBox, as I did at the beginning of the talk, you can see, we, if you have played the original, you can often see these visual glitches freezing in, in the animation, screen tearing in the middle of the screen. Sometimes you'll see that the frame is not displayed properly. Uh, and accelerated playback, because in those days, they never thought that these animations could never play uh, fast enough, so they didn't put a, a, a frame cap. So today, if you play it on a faster system, the animation will go much faster. Uh, this is of course, these are, of course, uh, tremendous distortions of the experience. And this is due, because, uh, this is due uh, um, because we don't emulate the systems completely. Uh, emulation is uh, using software to duplicate the hardware of previous platforms and for instance, the Super Nintendo is said to be emulated at 94%. It's enough for most games. It's not enough for, uh, to have perfect emulation of all the games. DOS is not a simple platform. It's an architectural mess. It's got many CPUs of the Intel family. It's got many RAM configurations between the 640 kilobytes, the extended memory, etc. It's got many graphic cards, and it's got many, many, many SUN cards. Uh, what I want to focus on right now, to go a bit away from the visual aspect, which is often discussed, we're going to talk about sound a little bit. MIDI uh, is the, the interface slash code often used in the 90s. Uh, it's a library of synthetic instruments. It's a code used to compose the music on PCs and then to play it out. But to play it out, your output will depend on specific chips. So that's why you buy a sound card. And depending on the quality of your sound card, it will vary greatly. Um, DOSBox, I thought at first, would allow me to get a Roland MT32 at last. I mean, back then it would set you back 500, more than $500. Think about that ne next time you buy a new console at $400 and feel completely ripped off. Uh, $500 for this card, needless to say, it was not very widespread. Um, and now I'm thinking, wow, true emulation? I have the opportunity to experience 
at last, the beauty No, sorry, this is not the right one. So, through emulation, I can experience the beauty that uh, these games did include, but I never had the opportunity to, to listen to at the time. So, I'm going to restart the emulator, because it doesn't seem to be looking pretty good right now. I'm looking for the Seven Guests, which is probably a game that many of you have played. And if you played it, you remember uh, the music, probably, which was very striking for this game. Uh, you remember the general ambiance, you remember the experience vaguely. Uh, we'll see the visual glitches, and we'll see, as you can see here, please wait while the rolling MIDI drivers are loaded. So that's promising, right? We're expecting the the real deal to be loading up here. Um, wow, such anticipation. moving a bit faster than this. So, as a DOSBox user, you need to know how to manipulate the emulator. Ah, this is more like it. Even though there's some glitch in. Oh, and you can see some screen tearing right there, which I don't remember from my original experience. Was it there? Was it not? Maybe I didn't have a trained eye back then to know about it. And we'll get to the issue of the archives in a moment. So yes, at last I'm playing the game in its full capacity. Or so it's reasonable to think. If you actually bother to, um, to go through the DOS box, documentation, you'll come across this uh, quote. DOSBox currently does not provide emulation of general MIDI or the MT32 Roland, instead passing the music data along to the MIDI device installed on your system. However, most modern PCs provide only very basic MIDI functionality and therefore attempts to use general MIDI MT32 music under DOSBox usually end up sounding rather poor. So that's a complete distortion. What you just heard is actually the synthetic instruments of the general MIDI used by my computer, which is probably not even something as good as what the real Roland MT32 was. And I'm seeing this and I'm left wondering how many uh, Let's Play or Long Plays on YouTube using DOSBox. Uh, guys, girls, just select the best sound option they think available and end up archiving for us these older games with completely fake sound that was not any way close to the original experience. We could go further than that and say, what's the point of archiving MT32 Roland if 95% of players back then played it using Sound Blaster card, which didn't sound anywhere close to uh, Roland MT32. I don't have much time left, so I'm going to skip this part uh, now, uh, just to say that in Disney we archived the visual, the audiovisual aspects through DVD recorders, and uh, we have a website where we showcase some of these uh, archives uh, converted to MPEG-4, and um, there's a whole different problem there because there's layers of artifacts and compression artifacts that you have to face when you archive using these technologies because MPEG-2 and MPEG-4 are codecs and are using compression to create smaller files. So again, you're adding layers and layers of distortion. When I speak of frozen frames, what I mean is that the accessibility of experiences is, is frozen in time. Uh, first of all, all, older hardware becomes unavailable as industrial production evolves, like we're not producing the chips that we were producing 10, 20 years ago, and we won't be producing them again at a decent cost, so it's likely to completely disappear. Uh, proper technical knowledge is another problem. As a researcher, it's hard to find the right information, and most of us are not trained to have uh, a technical proficiency 
good enough to know about all these technical details that I, that I showcase, and it's often much more complicated than what I've showed today. Uh, I think that the original experience is obviously getting frozen in layers and layers of ice, but we can do uh, many things as historians to, to help this out. We need a living archive. I think that emulation is absolutely necessary in a context where your technology is dying. Uh, emulation is the only way to preserve these games and to access uh, an interactive experience. But as I said, it's rare to find emulation that's 100% accurate. So I think that we need to supplement these with audiovisual archives with the original hardware so that you know what screen glitch was there, what, what screen glitch was not there, how it sounded, what speed was it playing at. Uh, and what I'm working on right now is to add an, an, another layer, a conceptual archive, where we de develop a language to describe the experience outside of the big terms that we use, such as first person um, and uh, the genre's name that are very fuzzy too. So that's what uh, I'm working on right now with my colleagues from, from University of Montreal. So that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, so my, my angle tonight is the demo scene, uh, which is a very not well-known community and artistic practice here on this side of the ocean. Uh, I think the angle that this will be adding to this discussion is um, th there is the com we can see computers as tools that have enabled a uh, new new practice or at least transformation of existing practices. For example, architecture, which obviously existed before the computer, and cinema and the uh, the promise and or the dream of interactive cinema. But this layer here is how the computer also afforded maybe new forms that were difficult to think of or to imagine without a computer and with their own set of aesthetic criteria. So this is what I'm going to talk about, the demo scene. Uh, I won't be addressing uh, directly the issues of archiving and or archaeology or hi history research, but I think many of the things I'll be saying will uh, painfully underline the, the difficulties for such a, an endeavor. We might discuss it afterwards. To, to really get a glimpse or a feeling of how important the demo scene was at its heyday, or at least in, in its golden years, uh, I, I chose to make, make a biographical, autobiographical presentation. So 1993, this is not the beginning of the demo scene, but the beginning of my engagement with it, and this is the kind of things that were in the minds of people who were interested in games and computers, which Carl has underlined, and many of us were thinking that uh, computers would push further the things we already knew. Interactive cinema and the CD-ROM was the promise of things to come. So much data, so much of opportunities to record the real world and uh, permute it, transmute it in the computer. So this is what was exciting, really, what we're looking forward. One other thing that was of interest to me was the beginning of networking. I had. I spent all the money I earned as a paper boy to buy a modem and discovered the wonderful world of BBSs, which were kind of the, the ancestor of the internet for the, for, the, for the common people. And as I was browsing in one of these, uh, the files of one of these BBSs, I discovered th this description, this file description. Second Reality by Future Crew, the winning demo of Assembly 93. Now, this evokes nothing to me, might not evoke anything to you or might. Uh, so I download this, which is two megabytes, maybe half an hour of download, and of course my expectations are quite low because what is it that you can put in two megabytes that will impress me? What's a demo, anyways, and what's Assembly 93? So this is what I this is what I get. I start from not the beginning, but just because I can't show the whole thing. No, yes.
So uh, this might seem trivial for someone in 2013, but it still gives me shivers. Uh, but it, you need to imagine how mind-blowing this was in 1993, because I mean I couldn't understand all that I was seeing because it didn't reference to anything I knew. But also, but I knew enough of computers to know that this wasn't all pre-written or pre-drawn. This was happening live. This had to be real time because it, there was no space for it to be recorded in two megabytes. So something amazing was being done on my computer that had nothing to do with tons of data on a CD-ROM. And it, it changed many things in my whole life. Uh, and so uh, what's different? The difference, we have full motion video, but not pre-recorded. Also, we have digital music, but where did they put it? Because I can't see 650 megabytes there. So to understand where this came from, we'll take a few steps back and try to brief, very brief history of the demo scene. Uh, a strange artistic practice rises from piracy. Uh, in the late 1980s, people have uh, personal computers, and of course they discovered the fact that they don't need to pay for software since it's so easy to copy. And some groups, usually younger people, uh, get, get together to distribute this software and give themselves in imaginary names because it's illegal, and get a lot of um, kudos from doing this. And, but one, one thing they need to do is to crack this software, because the software is usually uh, piracy protected with different schemes, and so to distribute it effectively, you need to go into the code and remove those protections. So this is actually a very difficult thing to do, but for the end user, you don't see that. It either works or not, and if it works, we don't really care. So here we have Cracked by the Grand Illusion. If you imagine that if you give yourself the nickname of the Grand Illusion, maybe you want some recognition <laughs> in life, but cracking won't give you that so much. One thing that will, though, is the loader or the crack row, and that is the small little file that you give with the software where you can express yourself. So this is the, the oldest crack row I have on my computer, 1990, but there were some before, obviously. So, whoops, oh yeah, <laughs> the humble guys, yeah, not so humble, that from 1990, we own the IBM. So we have here animation, uh, color rotation, a scrolling text, where of course you thank your buddies and, and show your, all the good things you've done. But this people can understand. They see these things moving around in the colors and that, that, that's pretty good code. Where the cracking, yeah, it's good code, but you don't know. And uh, the, the, one of the social venues for this community to coalesce is the copy party where everybody, your buddies and yourself a good get together with your computer so that it's more it's faster to copy the floppies and pass them around. But as things progress, many of the crackers, the coders that do the crack get much more interested in that loader and that graphical presentation they do rather than the actual cracking which has its limits in terms of visibility and fun of code. So these copy parties translate or convert to demo parties where the main object of that of that event is to show off your skills for these audiovisual presentations, and you get uh, votes, and you get ranked as the best demo, second best demo, and this is where it begins, where this, there's a divorce from the cracking scene, and the demo scene becomes really invested in the artistic presentation from code. Uh, and these parties, it's, it's worthy to, to, note, to mention that this happens at the beginning mostly in Northern Europe, uh, as Finland, Norway, uh, Sweden, and then quite quickly moves on to the rest of the continent. But it has to be mentioned also that on this side, in North America, for example, and elsewhere in the world, uh, this was very marginal, although not non-existent. I won't have time much to mention this, but Montreal is actually, was actually the capital of the demo scene in North America. Okay, uh, so what, what's... What are these demos? What, what are, the, what are the, uh, the aesthetic canon of a demo? One thing that has to be mentioned is the heritage of these people, these new programmers, usually a young generation, with older hackers with uh, more in, or older machines. Here I have a quote from hackers, uh, the heroes of the digital revolution. A certain aesthetic of programming style had emerged because of the limited space of the TX0. 
hackers came to deeply appreciate innovative techniques which allow programs to do complicated tasks with very few instructions. So of course this is, this is an art that isn't very accessible to most people, but those who are engaged with it surely recognized that good code is art, or at least that's what they thought. Uh, and so these young demo sceners, they inherit from that thinking. So uh, to understand the, uh, the, the, the aesthetic criteria of a demo, we also need to understand the affordances and constraints of the, f and of the form they're engaging with. And the first one is very limited size. Of course, at the crack, uh, a crack tool needs to be small because you don't want to encroach on the size of that software you're delivering. So they were usually only a few Ks, so, so that you won't need to throw in another diskette on top of the other. And when, when you had demo parties, then you could liberate the, the size for demo at least up to a few megabytes, but it still had to be quite small for it to be distributed on floppies for a long time, and then on BBSs, which were so slow that you it would be a hard, you would have a hard time delivering it on more space than that. And also, they had to be made on either aging. The Amiga was a great machine for the demo scene. It most, the initial groundwork was done there, but it was not replaced by something comparable. And the, the importance of PCs became, uh, so, well, the, 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 the PC became the computer of, uh, the more popular computer, but it was completely unfit for multimedia presentation. So that was an added challenge for demo coders to, uh, to exploit the PC. But what were the, what were the things that did, uh, what could be afforded by this form is first, demos are a dedicated application. They have nothing else to do than do that stuff they do. And that's very important because it means that you have undivided access to all the uh, computer's resources, the processing power, and also you can code it in any way you want, uh, or however hackish it can be, so you don't need to do well-designed code, portable code, or well-commented code for other people to delve into, because once the demo scene, the demo party deadline falls, if it works, it works, that's all. It's, it's enough, you probably won't ever open that code again. And you can also do low-level code, because you intend to, you're probably aiming for one specific platform, and you can use whatever opportunities are under the hood to do what you want to do. So, what, I, I actually forget one of these things. So what are the aesthetics of the demo form? First, optimization. That might seem strange in, an, in the art world that optimization might be a, an important criteria, but it is because it shows your prowess, in a fact, in a way. And then there's that notion of process versus data. The, the output of the demo is through algorithms and processes and, the com and computing rather than recorded material from wherever. Uh, of course, the, the one thing that I forgot is real-time. Real-time is one of the most distinguishing features of demos. They are not pre-recorded, they happen live. And that's very novel. Clever, novel use of resources and an elegant form. It's important that you don't just show what you can do, but that it's wrapped up in such a way that is engaging and uh, pleasing. So one of the uh, one of the most well-known contributions of the demo scene to, uh, to computers is the module tracker. It, in second reality, I couldn't, I couldn't understand where they found, how they recorded that music, but what they're, because it's clearly digital music. But what's happening is that they only have a few samples of actual sound. So this is not the same song, but it's another one. The very small pieces of actual digital data which are all put together in patterns, very lightweight, and the, the music is generated from there. This might sound orchestral, but it actually fits in 400 Ks. So this is actually a technology that was used in many games afterwards because it was so lightweight. But also on the front, on the visual side, you want to show that you, your code is so well optimized that you can pack all these polygons on the screen, which might, seem, might have seemed impossible. So that's not so elegant to say exactly what you did, but at least the message comes through. So this, this Hornet has 23,000 
800 faces right there, real time on your computer. I'm not sure that's true, they might be lying. <laughs> and <laughs> of course, procedural effects. This is just one example, but if you're gonna do 10 minutes of audiovisual content with two megabytes, then these things need to come from somewhere that are very lightweight and algorithm procedural generation is where it comes from. It, it gives results that look like nothing else that you might have seen. And in clever use of resources, demo theaters here might, uh, might laugh at this old school trick, but it, it, it represents one of the, the approaches. These copper bars actually display more colors than the, uh, the actual palette or, or the actual hardware could show because the coder is using a trick to fool the computer into showing more colors uh, by exploiting the way it displays the, uh, the, the, the content on screen. So anyways, I won't exp I'm not sure I could explain it, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's a programming trick. And so you should see something that you thought impossible. And of course, elegant form, that's wrapping it up in, in an interesting, clever, artistic way, and that became more and more important as opposed to just sheer coding pow power. And just to finish, uh, there are so many things to be said that you better not say anything, but <laughs> I'll just show you a contemporary demo that I, in, I enjoy very much. It's, I almost always show this one because it's one of my favorites, but it really, I think, shows the essence of the contribution of the demo scene. Uh, so this demo is 4K, 4 kilobytes, you can see that here. I chose one that I could run on my laptop so that the demonstration is, is uh, credible. All right, so what is 4K? 4K is that much data, that's all. So of course you, we don't understand it, it's machine code, but it means maybe two pages of text. So what can we pack in two pages of text? minutes. <laughs> Thanks. The last picture was fractals? Yeah, yeah. Okay. What, what, is it a junior set or what is it? Um, I, anyone can answer? Oh, uh, the question is, the, what we saw was a fractal, yes? very lightweight, you can make a lot of visual content from a very small set of instructions. Uh, but which fractal is it? Is it a Julia? No. Is it a Mandelbrot? No. I can't remember its name. <laughs> but if I, if, if, if I took a few minutes, I could tell it to you afterwards. <laughs> okay, um, I actually have um, a great deal of questions for both of you. As both of these, uh, both of your presentations line up with research that um, that I've done, as I said, both academically and as a curator. And uh, the first thing that you said, Carl, that was really interesting to me was, um, not the first thing, it was actually one of the last things you said that was that really uh, hit a note, was this idea of, um, can you explain what you mean by a conceptual archive? I, I think this is a really interesting idea. I mean, you're talking about like framing this within a language. Um, and when, when you said conceptual archive to me, and before you would mention Let's Play videos, 
those feel like that they may or may not actually fall into part of being part of this sort of like collective conceptual archive of gameplay experience. Uh, the, the point of what I'm trying to do right now is, um, well, first there's a, we need to, to acknowledge the fact that the language we use to describe the experience of video game is very fuzzy, it's very uh, unclear. When you say an adventure game, in the, in the different moments in history, it means completely different things. It can mean different components of gameplay. When you say first person, in some points in video game history, you see the avatar and they describe it as first person. So if you continue to use this language, uh, and a, a researcher in a hundred years from now go back to these experiences, he's going to be completely, uh, completely um, taken aback by the, the fuzziness of it all, by the, the unprecision. So what we're trying to do right now, me and, and some assistants at the University of Montreal, is to create these um, these descriptors to to talk about the experience of video games. So right now we're working on the categories of virtual action, you know, neutralization, uh, uh, handling of tools, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're trying to define categories of action and we're def defining mappings of actions. Like the Wii mode seeks to have a symbiotic mapping. Okay, but few games integrate symbiotic mapping. It's most games in integrate very, very symbolic forms of mapping between what you do in the, in the inter on the interface and what you do in the virtual world. So we're trying to have very, very specific language to describe the experience, and then you tag the video games according to this language. It won't ever be a perfect representation of the gameplay experience, but I think it's necessary to move beyond what we have right now, because when you go on mobile games right now, uh, you have Mad Dog McCree listed as a first-person game. It was never listed, uh, a shooting gallery cannot be listed as a first-person game. When you're at the shooting range at the, the fair, you're not going, I'm living a first-person experience right now. Okay, you know what I mean? So we need to be very specific about why these terms came to be in the history of video games. So we need to clean up, I think, the language we're using and be able to propose a very clearly defined uh, set of concepts to analyze. and. Uh, these, this conceptual archive will supplement the audiovisual archive and the emulation. So when, that's what we tried to do with you this you add an excerpt of the game on the database and we try to tag it with the concepts that we were using at the time. So uh, for a researcher going back to this corpus in many, many years, you would just uh, see that, okay, in this gameplay segment, uh, the player is doing this, this, there is, he's manipulating the interface in this, these and these ways. So that's what we're trying to do right now. Great, that's, uh, that's actually really interesting. It reminds me a lot of um, conversations that I've been having lately with uh, categorical distinctions in the art game world. Um, so, so now we have these terms, we have, we have game art, which is art derivative of games. We have art games, which are works of art that are games themselves. Uh, a group of people in Europe uh, starting a movement called Not Games. So what they are looks like a game, it might feel like a game, but there's something about it that makes it definitively not a game. Um, so, so this kind of work is actually really interesting, I think, in terms of a discipline that's so young um, across the board right now, uh, because I feel like there's sometimes we're using the same terminology but we're actually not talking about the same things, and that, that ends up being a real challenge, I, I think, for us with you know being so young and not having this established lexicon. There. Exactly. We're often we're not talking exactly about what we think we're talking about. Uh, there's a project by Henry Lowood and Rayford Quinn's uh, called "Debugging Game History." It will be a book published by MIT Press where they ask many scholars to actually take a very common expression. For instance, I had first-person shooters, and to try to trace how the expression appears in language, when it's used, in what context, etc. So I think it would be a good book to try to do some work in that direction. Any questions out there? I can keep going. Okay, go ahead. Uh, this is a question for me, Carl. I'm just curious what you feel is at stake in this uh, effort to capture, as you said, this sort of original experience. Like, what is it that's important about actually knowing, okay, well, what? Assuming that you can even get to an original <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not a fool. I know I cannot get back. It's frozen in time. Uh, I, I, it's frozen, and there's layers and layers of ice piling up on top of it. Um, as a historian, what I'm interested in is telling the history of the culture around video games, and that involves many, many things. And if we're going to be able to discuss that culture, we still need to have 
as good as it gets in terms of the original experience. And I'm saying as good as it gets because I know I'm not a purist. I know even if you recreate the piece, typical PC experience, what is, what is that even? I mean, back then there were so many different uh, PC rigs. There was so, so much discrepancy in how games ran on your computer. So we cannot, uh, we cannot acknowledge uh, sorry, we cannot accommodate all that. We cannot recreate that experience in all its complexity. Uh, but we should still keep traces. And I think that these, the, the idea of having a living archive, an audiovisual archive, and a conceptual archive that supplement each other is probably the, the best we can do. And it's, it's a lot of work. But I think it's still important historically because then it becomes easy to just discuss the culture of video games from. Uh, you know, for a story in a hundred in a hundred years from now, in a completely distorted way, if you don't actually have access to the original or a trace of what might have been the original experience. Well, I have a question about the audiovisual archive, and if you're interested in any way, not just capturing what's shown on the screen or comes from the speakers, but also players in, in you know filming the players themselves. Uh, yes, we could. Uh, the question is uh, if we are interested in capturing the, the actual plane, the, the player in front. And yes, that would solve a lot of problems already uh, to be able to do that. And yes, we there's you know there's a lot we could do. There's eye tracking. We could capture so much information about the playing of games. Uh, there we could use what they use in the, the game companies and uh, calculate the pre button presses directly from the interface. Uh, that's expensive software. That's expensive hardware. Um, yes, give me the money, and I'll do it. That, that's the bottom line. Well, one of the interesting things that we think about when we talk about this authentic experience um, that I think about, if we're talking about playing a game in the 90s, and we're still talking about that sort of that one-to-one -one relationship between us and the machine that's playing the game, uh, one of the questions that I always think about when, I, when people start discussing authentic experience is this idea of how do, how do we situate what, we, what an authentic experience is, because for me, playing an FMV game would be sitting in front of a giant wooden CRT TV, possibly while wearing acid wash jeans and a hypercover t-shirt, um, with a neon hat, maybe. Uh, but this idea that like all of that sort of paratextual stuff that, um, that relates to our experience as a whole that's outside of the game and this challenge of this is the challenge with authenticity that I sort of feel that I'm facing when I'm doing this similar kind of work with the cultures that I've been researching, is how, how far can the documentation go, um, how far are we willing to take it, and how much of that is actually useful moving forward as well, like how comprehensive can we be. And I just, I want to relate this back to um, the demo scene a bit too, because the demo scene like FMVs is sort of this non-monolithic ongoing project in some way. Um, and recently I saw demo videos of people um, running demos on old Nokia phones, um, which is really like sort of different than what I thought the demo scene was. But what I'm interested in too in, in this respect with authenticity is clearly the cultures are archiving themselves in some way. Uh, what does that look like um, and, and how does that work? Because I'm sure that both of you and myself as researchers have turned to uh, fan databases, uh, websites, forums, and all of that kind of stuff for information. So maybe we can talk about like, that aspect a little bit. Well, just a note about archiving. <clears throat> the demo scene, as I mentioned, the, the demos are very specific to a platform and usually it becomes very hard running them maybe even one month later. So it's, there's very, they're even more fickle than the games. One thing that saves them in a way is the fact that since they're not interactive, we don't need to preserve so much the experience since the experience was passive viewing. But I think that's also a shame because part of the excitement was seeing your own machine do that thing. And if you only watch a video, then the viewing experience is not as different than just viewing a Pixar movie, which was pre-rendered a long time ago. But here I, I took the, the, the effort to, to show you it live it's a very ontological difference and not sensible difference, but for me it makes all the difference. I find viewing a demo as a recorded video very boring, but when I can, when I'm sure it's real time, it has this quality that makes it different. So this will be very difficult to render. 
Uh, as for the, uh, the community archiving itself, of course, it's doing that because it's the only one aware of itself. <laughs> so if the demo seniors don't do it, nobody will, and they know how to do it. But, but of course, it's not perfect, and I don't know if it has to be, but the efforts are being done. Uh, just to be sure I understand what you're saying, that uh, as the technology improves, uh, many of these demos running on, on, let's say, current generation Windows or Linux probably wouldn't run like a, a year from now? Well, the, the, the earlier, the, the more recent ones have a longer longevity because the computers now have, are more compatible from one uh, generation to the other, but the older ones aren't. Uh, so, yeah, that's and, the most important. And when you use DOSBox for uh, these older demos, uh, do, do you remember, do you see disparities? Because you said a very important difference. My talk was all data intensive, FMB is data intensive, and what he's, he showed was uh, process intensive. And process emulation is actually the complicated part. Emulating perfectly all the process of a hardware system into software is complicated. That's why it's only 94%, it's not perfect. So have you noticed any disparity in the execution of live demos, as you say? Well, you have a hard time making them work, even on the emulator, because it needed a lot of configuration, even on the original machines, so sometimes it just won't work. But uh, no, I haven't noticed much disparities in the output. But it's likely. But it's likely. It's just maybe because my memory is imperfect, and I figured that's what it looked like right. <laughs> the first time. Yeah, like I, the new tech demos that I mentioned on the Amiga that was show, showcasing the, the best the system could do, the system could actually display uh, its uh, whole uh, palette the, of 4,096 colors all at once on the screen with some restrictions, of course. And on the demo, when you run it on the Amiga, there's actually a moment where it says, Newtech managed to do this in high resolution in, four, in six four, uh, 640 by 400 pixels in 4,000 uh, colors, which was not supposed to be able to be done. Like you said, they have access to uh, low-level code. But when you run it through an emulator, this screen doesn't display. It, it just doesn't display because the, uh, the the guys did a fantastic job emulating the Amiga, but it's never, like, it's rarely 100%. Yeah, especially if you make a special case of finding that undocumented feature yes. in the processor that you can exploit, you can't expect the emulator to necessarily emulate that. <laughs> I have well, two questions. Uh, one, uh, which uh, examples or references do you think uh, the idea of archiving the digital the game uh, could uh, be inspired or the motivation? Like, you know, the CCA, we have the trouble, okay, we, we are born in a culture of archiving drawings uh, on paper and archiving uh, books on architecture, which means that there is a kind of very heavy imprint, a very heavy genetical code that probably is uh, influenced the way we foresee the future archivation of uh, the digital. So I was wondering, in, in the reflection of how to archive video games, which are the sources, which are the references that one uh, has looked at or should look at? Is it uh, how movies are archived? Is it, uh, I mean, what, what is the kind of cultural uh, references that you, you need to manipulate in order to conceptualize uh, how things should be archived? And also the second question is, uh, which are the objectives, again, in cultural terms of unpleasure or application? Uh, because again, the models that we enacted are models of preservation of knowledge in a way, and a lot of things have been discarded in the process because they were meant not to be so relevant. So what, what, who and why are we archiving for? Is it, as you say, to try to revive the experience of playing um, the old way? Is it because we, we recognize a certain cultural value the tents can be later researched in a more scholarly way, which are somehow the reasons why these operations are meant. So you say that there might be some kind of like self construction of a community in your case. Uh, no one, I think it's fine. So it could be interesting to better understand where it comes from or why it's operating for which, which purposes. Do you want to start? Maybe start with the video games. Um, the, I, I've just been at uh, an event in New York uh, City. They have a new game center there at uh, the Game Studies Program. And uh, G.P. Dyson, which is the, the uh, video games curator at the Strong Museum of Play in Rochester, New York, uh, answered your question, basically, uh, when you ask which model from previous archiving practices should we look up to to do uh, what we're trying to do here. And he said uh, architectural preservation. 
and what he meant by that is that is it, this model helped him to, uh, he asked the same questions that people who are working with architecture and preservation of architecture ask themselves. Do you give access? If you give access to the architectural part, the video game on both sides, uh, what does it imply? Uh, and more than that, he said, and I'm not very familiar with architectural preservation, but he said that they have actually an easier time conceiving of updating the basic technology, and I'm using technology here in a very broad sense, but used in the architecture. So if you need to update the structure, if you need to update certain components of the structure, uh, apparently that's commonly done in architectural preservation. And so his point was, we. We have to do the same for video games. Video games are all gonna die. All these machines that you have, they're all going to dust. Uh, they're not going to be reproduced. Nintendo won't be doing the Super Nintendo in, in 100 years just for the fun of preservation. Uh, so emulation is the way. Uh, G.P. Dyson's point was that you actually uh, can do hardware, uh, even, I mean, uh, even making it better. Like, there's tons of ways in emulators to run the games at higher resolution, for instance. He said, yes, you can do that. You can update the hardware as long as you document it properly. So let's say in the context of an exhibit, uh, if you're presenting the game on an emulation, say how the experience is altered by this update uh, of technology. And uh, so that's, in a way, you're at, at the same time archiving the original experience and archiving the upgrade of this experience by the new technology. So, and to quickly answer your second question for who are we doing this, uh, the quick answer for me is uh, by being able to preserve traces of this culture, you're also preserving traces of what this culture says about our broader culture. So for any cultural historian who wants to look at what video games were in our age and what it might say about our culture, uh, it's important to preserve. So for who, I, I'm thinking cultural historians. And if, if Scott wanted to put all his uh, fluo hats and neon clothing back and play FMV games for me, I would be happy to film you doing that. <laughs> Finding a hypercolor shirt that will still fit me, I totally <laughs> will we'll, we'll work on that. We'll recreate that experience. <laughs> um, I just I just want to follow what Carl was saying, because there's there's interesting questions about sort of like who is doing this and, and how is it happening and what does it look like. And my focus has been on something that I call um, the pirate archive which is not really an archive at all, because it's not institutional, it's not centralized, and it's very, very fleeting. So, um, for my master's thesis was on the history of piracy on the Sega Dreamcast, and how that led to hacking practices based on the piracy practices, so how people started modifying the games and making them their own. And the challenge in finding the information that I needed led me to more dead links than I could possibly think about until I actually found this thing called um, BitGamer, which was sort of like, it was a torrent site that was closed to members only. I don't know if I should be talking about this on camera, but... Um, <laughs> and, and what BitGamer was, was a, was a, a collection of, of um, gamers who were taking media from their own personal collections, uh, whether that be books, games, old VHS tapes that were actually sort of like how to play this game efficiently, like the how to win Pac-Man, how to beat Mario Brothers, all of this stuff, digitizing it, including old games, and putting it up for torrents for people to, other, other enthusiasts to share. And it was fairly comprehensive. I was really impressed with the comprehensive nature of it. And what they did, because they didn't want to, the reason it had an archival focus was in their ethos, which said that nothing prior to 2003 can be shared through this network. So we are not interested in pirating contemporary games. We are interested in only sharing media that we can't have access to otherwise. Um, and it was actually shut down recently. And one of the reasons that we're seeing this, this challenge to sort of these personal collections and archives digitally with fan cultures is because we're now in a system, we're now entering into a generation of games that are um, eschewing physical media in favor of digital distribution and subscription-based models. So Xbox, I just updated my Xbox last night and now I can play games on demand, which means I no longer have access to like a library. It's in the cloud somewhere. Yeah. And they can actually go back, and this is, this is something that's been happening time and again as we're seeing HD re-releases of games from previous consoles. Um, and we're seeing things, Nintendo has something called the virtual console, which is everything from 
the Game Boy, all the way up to essentially the Nintendo 64. And what they want to do is they want to repackage these and sell them again digitally. So they're challenging these fan cultures because they, one of the interesting things is, is the archive that Nintendo would be interested in is the Nintendo archive is you know a very sort of like this this kind of corporate platform partisan archive that would be accessed only through whatever like subscription service in the future or hardware Nintendo has. So Sony and Xbox are doing the same thing. You have publishers that are sort of trying to to cover their bases and do this for everybody. So the, ch the challenges that we're facing now, even as is archivists institutionally, I think that's going to happen, is is looking at what's going to happen with this kind of problem, and how are we going to address that? Uh, yeah, that's completely true, and we just quick follow up on this. Um, hardware will die, corporations can die too. We shouldn't rely on Nintendo to salvage Nintendo, no, even if, if that's what they will be the most interesting in doing. That, as you point out, of course, they, they have a very partial view of the video game history, but corporations can die too. And uh, so I think what we're doing right now is we, and the, the community that you're talking about who did all this work is actually the one who's the most proactive in doing the archiving. Uh, and they did, you know, they have complete run collections of all the games of the Sega Master System, et cetera, et cetera. They're the one dedicated to creating protocols, archiving methods for these games. And without them, I couldn't do my job right now. There would be so much less, um, uh, so much more work to be done. Uh, I'm curious if you know the details of why that community shut down. It was a copyright violation. It was it, like straight up uh, violating our IP uh, right. sort of situation. Some sort of injunction. They got a takedown notice, uh, and then their um, their host basically sort of panicked and shut it down. They've been trying to move it. Have been following the updates, but so far nothing nothing has happened. And the interesting things about games too is this idea of like. Something that I'm personally interested in um, is I do this project called Ghost Arcade, which is actually about non-corporate made games. So I'm talking about bootlegs um, and all these other sort of like undersides of, of, of gaming cultures. So myths, games have, video games has lots of a written mythology, which is very interesting, like the myth of Polybius, if anybody knows that. Um, and trying to source these kind of these kind of odd things that really only people within the culture themselves know, and really only people within the culture themselves actually value. Um, there, there seems to be very little value in that project, um, perceived value in that project, sort of in, in, in sort of institutional archives. The idea that these things existed outside of this sort of um, industrial spectrum of production actually marginalizes all of these works, and people would rather acknowledge they don't exist. Rather than rather than actually looking at them and say what does this thing say about the culture, um, which is I think linking like in an interesting way links back to the early days of the demo scene with um, with the crack throws and this idea that crack throws were a way for game pirates um, to sort of claim authorship over their work, not even sort of like in a very real way claim authorship over their work, and I think the same thing sort of emerges through these fan archival practices, is that people are actually claiming authorship over the archiving of certain pieces, uh, which is also very interesting. Do you want to do you want to, do you want to No. <laughs> Maybe just one layer of complexity with the demo scene is since, because of its roots in piracy, all the people you know, you don't know them because you only know their nickname. So if you go out and try to find who is the great illusion, he probably doesn't have that name on Facebook, and so he's, it's lost. It, well, that's very difficult, a very difficult thing, even, for lo even locally. Many people I knew, I can never find a trace of them. Absolutely. Quickly, I've been proactive in trying to get into the history books, just like as Ralph Bayer is out there everywhere if you want to interview him. <laughs> I've they been like, really pushing to get their, the spotlight back on them? Or? Not so much. There, there's a Hungarian documentary. <laughs> Interesting. I just want to know a bit more about the demo scene in Montreal, just to sort of get back. Yeah, to yeah sure, I was hoping for that question. And I, and I wondered also uh, if you would talk about why it was um, big in Montreal, because I think you said yeah. that it was bigger here than... Right? Yeah, I, 
these are questions that I wish I could answer to. First, why Scandinavia? I have had this, this conversation with many other people. There are hints for that, and why here in Montreal? Uh, I, I, I can't answer that question. Well, the main, maybe the main reason is that there have been proactive people in making demo parties in Montreal, and that created a momentum for, for Montreal and attracted people from all over. North America, so that's probably the, the most concrete, the concrete answer. So the demo scene in Montreal begins. All, actually, Canada is very is represented as soon as Assembly '94, which is quite early, with two demos, one from Montreal and one from Kingston. I, find. I think it's probably the only two demos not from Europe. Uh, they're from Canada in 1994, <coughs> and and there have been demo parties in Canada in '95, big demo parties in '95, '96, where that gathered pretty much all the demo scene of North America. There were hundreds and hundreds of people. There was even the famous Jason Scott of uh, the, the, these documentaries, he was there. And I organized demo parties there in 99, 2000, 2001, and last year. And there's gonna be one also this year, but it's a very, it's a very confidential community now. It's more, everybody that, is, that goes to these demo parties had gone to the 1995 demo parties, so it's, it's probably mostly a nostalgic, almost, uh, community because there's not much new demo, that many new demos done here, uh, except maybe for one group, but is lively elsewhere in, the, in Europe. So why Montreal? I don't know. Now the bigger demo party in, in North America is in Boston, so not so far. <laughs> and I don't have more keys to, to, to explain it. Uh, I had a question about, actually you had a, maybe a hint of why was that the case in Scandinavia, you mentioned that uh, having the same platform is right. actually something important and uh, as you said, once the PC takes over, the platform, and as I've shown in my talk too, as the PC becomes more popular, the platform is so moving, it changes all the time, the configuration is rarely the same between two users and uh, isn't there the part, the, the dimension of comp competition between the, the demo makers? Like, we're using the same platform, so we're competing on the same ground and doing the best, excellent demo that we can do. And we, because that's what you do, you showcase your demo to your peers at these demo parties, and the best win, in a way. I, I think there were some competitions, even. Yo, yo, the competition is great, it is the main motivator. Uh, platform is important, as you mentioned, um, but I think for other reasons, and you know this as well, but the, the Amiga and Commodore, which were the most popular platform in Europe, were easier to program for visual results. And here the main platform was PC, which is a very a bummer to make anything move on the screen at that moment, so I think that, that, uh, that slowed down the process. And then speed picked up in Europe since these young people learned to program on the Amiga and then to transfer their skills to other platforms and move on. There are other things also, this is a cultural reason, but everybody here that was self learning programming uh, or graphics had one single idea and that was to enter the game industry. And for, for me, maybe for the reason that there was a game industry. And for it was in Europe, these young people were more, or at least maybe they didn't even have that in mind, they were even more interested in just showing off these things. So there's this culture of just exploring the form and exploring the form or exploiting the form for a very specific end and that, that's entering the market with something sellable and demos are, have nothing to sell. Most people I show demos to usually said, oh this is a screensaver. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? I, I, have, I want to follow up with because we're talking about. Oh, was there? Okay. Um, okay. Considering the kind of built in secrecy of the demo scene, isn't like, or maybe some of the early uh, computer works, isn't some kind of archiving or analysis going against some of the aim or the the way that community works in a certain way, and even talking about it, as, as you mentioned earlier, like, should I be saying this on camera? How, how is that? Yeah. Well, the demo scene is not secretive, but intimate. I don't think they have any, they, people in there have any problems being recognized. I think many people would love that. But the truth is that it's very hard to communicate because a certain basis of understanding of computers and their programming is needed for the appreciation of what you see. Except some very obvious example as a 4K intro, everybody is capable of understanding that this is amazing work, 
but more subtle work will be unseen because people will just say, this is the same thing as a 3D animation, so I don't see the point in that, or I don't see where anything's interesting in there. So the, the basis of, of competence to, to appreciate the demo, I think is a high barrier for its communication. So even if you have it very accessible on YouTube, I show this to, to some of my non-technical friends and find this utterly boring because they don't see any point to it. So, yeah, except for some exceptions. Well, I think there's something tied up it's in the demo scene that's really similar to the research that I did on the Dreamcast. Um, and you have, you have your piracy groups that were the ones responsible for cracking the GD-ROM disk, dumping the data to PC, figuring out how to burn this thing back to CD so you could play it on the on the system, and that's this idea of cultural capital within these communities. So these groups always list the members with their aliases in any info file that's attached to attached to their work, and that's again this idea of authorship. Um, but the demo scene, I mean, from everything that I've I've sort of encountered with it, is the same kind of idea. And when they're thanking friends, sometimes they're also flaming their competition, which is a really interesting idea. I mean, old. Old demo floppy magazines are a really good example of this, um, where people would start releasing uh, floppies that would have multiple demos on it, like a magazine with also text files, and there were there were like sort of I don't, I don't even know what the word would be like venomous language yeah. discussing other people within the demo scene who were making work, and they would be um, you know sort of def defaming these other people while trying to bolster themselves. And the same thing happened when I started going through dozens and dozens of files, um, of info files around Dreamcast piracy titles. Like it was this thing where you'd be like, we acknowledge the assistance and the legacy of all of these people that got us to here, but all of these people over here, they're our mortal enemies. And I found that really sort of interesting as well. <laughs> yeah, well, we're, we're there's a lot of talk these days of the toxic culture of video gaming. I have to say that it's the most the demo scene is to a large extent a very macho culture as well, a very male-dominated culture. And this idea of prowess through code also has its consequences in the way you communicate. So yes, it's it's amazing to see what people can do, but in interpersonal communication, it's not as beautiful because it's exactly as <laughs> what you say. Someone posts on the forum, oh look at look at that, it's my first ray trace. Whatever, and then, then a troll immediately comes in and say, "Oh, I feel like I've woke up in 1994 already," and then like go wake up to the world, not acknowledging that they've been doing this for 20 years, and newcomers would have a very hard barrier to go. <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering how different, like you're talking about how people like behave toward each other in online forums, but you're talking about demo parties yeah. where people would come together in person. What would be the difference in behavior between? Well, of course it's always softer in uh -huh. person, <laughs> but also it's, it has become softer as the demo scene has been aging. When people <laughs> were 17, these PBS bosses could come to a demo party and just say, oh yeah, we're the cheese brigade, and you know, we know how to code, and we're in our small crew, and, but that doesn't happen <laughs> you can, People can see the futility of such, of such things. <laughs> so, but yes, in, in person usually, it's much better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe I have a question about the archiving of, of maybe games. So what are the sources and where do you find the best collection of games, for example, and what exactly do you collect in terms of games? Is it only the final products, the, the CD, the floppy disk, or are you also interested in having, I don't know, the first draft of Game. I don't know if that even exists, but it's that we have. I can talk a bit about game prototypes because that's something I've actually been really interested in. Game prototypes are only archived if they're leaked, uh, <laughs> which is this, which is an interesting um, the, part of the part of the Ghost Arcade project I've been looking at is about how fans disseminate prototypes. So um, Resident Evil was a game that was released in '90. I'm going to say six. That might be wrong. Um, by Capcom, and immediately after the success of this game, they started building a sequel. Two thirds of the way through, they dumped the prototype and started from scratch, and yet somehow within the last five years, it's re-emerged online 
uh, and people have been have actually been able to cobble together what they found and create a playable demo of it and that are now calling Resident Evil 1.5. Um, and and those those archives that I was talking about specifically, there were people interested in finding unreleased prototypes. Um, sometimes it happens like someone just dumps a disc somewhere or a cartridge. Um, that's what happened with a lot of Atari prototype archiving. Is that um, publishers that were you know after Atari sort of had its financial trouble, um, a lot of publishers started dumping all of their Atari related stuff, and so you would get these cartridges that would be handwritten on with labels that people would find and then find ways to digitize those as Atari ROMs and actually share them with people. So the unreleased stuff in games officially in an institutional sort of archival sense, I, I, I would actually challenge anyone to actually find something in an archive that was in process because it's all about the final product. It's all about the game in usually a physical archive. You also want the paratext, so you want the cases you want the manuals, you want all the stuff sort of surrounding it, you want a complete object. Um, but with prototypes, it's, weird. it's It's kind of a weird thing. Um, I think of, did anybody, um, I don't want to out myself as a pirate completely during this talk, but um, years ago when the first X-Men Wolverine movie emerged online, um, you had this rare instance where the first leaked copy of it was a work print of a film where all of the special effects were actually still gray, um, uh, CG skinned, essentially just like modestly skinned wireframes that were all just placeholders. And so it was actually someone who worked at Fox who leaked it, um, who I believe ended up being sued. I can't remember. But um, it's one of those rare, rare instances where you see a product from a culture industry other than, other than the game prototypes um, emerging um, through sort of these like fan archival sort of file sharing processes, uh, which I, I think is really fascinating because I don't think we see enough of that, actually. Uh, I, I was going to add, well, to answer your question, what, what are the sources? Uh, the sources are this underground community that, that Scott has mentioned, well, he's mentioned the Dreamcast community, but they have been incredibly proactive in est establishing listings of all that's been uh, published uh, and of doing ROM sets. A ROM set is a listing of all the available games for a platform, and uh, it also lists how, uh, the percentage of completion. So if they have ROMs for, let's say, 95% of these games, the ROMs, the, the, the TOLSEC, that's the standard ROM set, is said to be complete at 94%. And they are very proactive in doing that. I, I cannot evaluate the quality of their work because they have more competence than I do. They, they are better than this. At, uh, that, that they are better at this than I am, for sure. I wanted to show also MAM. This is the multiple arcade machine emulator. As you can see, there's like these games, which are listed here. They have sub games, which is like US set one, US set two, US set three, uh, bootleg with this chip, bootleg with this chip. They, these are released versions. So yes, this is the final product, but as we can see, there's already a lot of, for one game, there's already a lot of different uh, arcade boards that were released, so they, they're trying to document as much as they can these variations. Uh, at the History of Games International Conference, we, we had Brenda Romero, John Romero, and, and uh, Warren Spector, veteran game designers, and their take on it is that, yes, uh, send all your design stuff, send, send all your prototypes, your design documents, to GP Dyson or to uh, to the lab at University of Montreal or to any research center, because uh, yes, we might end up not needing to preserve all of this, but until we know what might be interesting to say with these objects, it might be better to keep more than to keep less. And as of now, we actually haven't kept a lot. Uh, there was this great moment at the conference where Brenda Romero says, uh, "One of my friends contacted me because uh, old files, complete." File, file drawers of my days at Surtech are being sold on eBay, and she had no idea where these things, how they left the company, where they headed, um, and so she, she contacted the Strong Museum and they bought it, they integrated it in their archive. Uh, I think this is definitely something good. Taito, Nintendo have been doing some preservation of prototype design documents, uh, arcade machine boards. You'd be, uh, you'd be uh, surprised to learn that not all video game makers care about what they do, and they often throw it at the, directly in the trash. 
And so some companies are starting to not do that, which is like, wow, a whole 40 years too late, you know? Um, so there's a lot of work to be done, but again, the underground preservation community, the, these pirates who are completely illegal for owning copies, digital copies of these games, are digital, you know, they're doing digital copies of the arcade flyers, they're putting these incredible front ends where you can access different versions of the games, you can access the, the, the paratextual elements. Uh, the work done by this underground community, again, is what allows me to work as an historian today, and I'm tremendously grateful to these people because they're doing all the hard work right now that the corporations don't want to invest the time in doing for the most part. Okay, I have another question. Are you interested by non-digital documents? Like, I don't know, correspondence? Uh, because this is, here, this is what we have, mainly we, in the exhibition, we don't have correspondence, we don't have lots of paper documents, drawings, etc., etc. So, do you think it would be also interesting to have this kind of document also for marker of a video game? Of, of course, and uh, at the strong bit, at the strong, they have 50,000 video game related artifacts. That's okay. not non digital artifacts, they have the, 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 the physical objects. But if we want to uh, spruce up and if we want to, to have more artifacts, digitization is the only way to go. I, I mean, there's so many things that we could preserve, and we don't have that much space. Just getting a decent lab in a university is a lot of money, so having Imagine the space they need at the Strong to have 50,000 artifacts preserved decently. Uh, digitization is, is inevitable, sadly. One of the, one of the things that I actually, um, as, uh, as I did, I, I'm not gonna say as an archivist, but as a collector that I find really interesting, um, are the notes that end up in game cases that are made by game players. So cheat codes, um, walkthroughs that they've made, maps that they've drawn, all of that kind of sort of play experience, paratextual stuff. And, and I have been known to scour thrift stores and actually go through games that end up in thrift stores or vintage game shops, specifically looking for those artifacts. Um, but the challenge is, is that nobody, if we want to talk about a, a, like a, a part of the culture that's deemed as throwaway, somebody keeping a cheat code from Sonic 2 in the case of Sonic 2 for the Sega Genesis, you know, it's not the kind of thing we're going to easily find. Those are the happy accidents that sort of speak to another element of the the, the, the sort of the, the culture that is really difficult to sort of find and ascertain. I think. If you're still working on these things, I have to give you. Um, uh, when I bought Final Fantasy XII uh, secondhand, uh, the clerk was all happy. It was like very like a procession or some ritual. He gave me a binder. The guy who came to uh, sell the game to Microplay also gave him uh, his cheap binder, or his, he was a completionist, let's call it by its name. He was a completionist, and he printed all the walkthroughs that he could find, everything that he could find about the game, and he took additional notes. It's about 200 page documents. So when I bought this Final Fantasy XII, 10 bucks, best 10 bucks I spent in my life, I also received in, in this ceremony, like the, he handed it to me, you know what I mean? He handed me the, 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 the big binder, yes, the, the codex of Final Fantasy XII, and there, and I'm like, oh my god, this is a postdoc right there, you know, there's, there's so much you can do with that. I, I haven't used it yet, I can hand it in to you. I, I will take it. I, a friend of mine actually, uh, when his parents were moving out of their house in Ottawa, discovered um, a box of binders in a very similar way from old PC games like King's Quest and Ultima and all these games. And uh, he didn't know what to do with them, and he asked me, and I took them off his hands enthusiastically, because one of the interesting things about those artifacts, for example, that are probably the hardest to find in the culture, are also the ones that connect us to these play experiences in a way that we wouldn't otherwise have at all. Um, and I think that's a really important thing to think about, and the, the problem is finding them. I mean, sometimes you'll find walkthroughs online, and Let's Play is a form of documenting play now, and there's all these sort of contemporary examples, but these older examples are getting increasingly more difficult to find. Um, and, uh, and and I wish there was a is some sort of way in which we could sort of convince people that these things even like if we want to talk about freeze framing, um, it, it, convincing these people that these are valuable artifacts needed to happen 30, 20, 30 years ago. Because um, these are the things, they don't even get thrown in garage sales, they get thrown out. They're scrap pieces of paper. Um, yeah. Well, what, is the, what is the lifetime 
of uh, digital, digitalized uh, archive. In other words, you say that's the way to go, and you were talking about the hundred years. But I mean, I don't think that the physical format will last that long. Whereas you have some um, paper, free acid paper, or whatever, and that that will last for a hundred years. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, I'm going to just say this, the lifetime of digital storage media is a mess. Uh, I know I've used this word a lot, but that's, as a young historian, that's... You clean up in your life. Yes. Uh, actually, it, it varies greatly, is what I mean by a mess. Um, the first floppy disks that, were, that are magnetic, they are coding the bits magnetically, are going fast. As, as a matter of fact, most of them, 25 years is probably... Uh, beyond their expected lifetime. So that means that all the original C64 floppies are dying as we are speaking right now. They're like running away. It's like completely, completely wasted. Um, and it's not the older computer to use the type of, uh, there were games on, uh, you know, those cassettes, magnetic tapes, that's even worse. Um, thankfully, the, the, the silicon, silicon is not that bad. Silicon is probably, they don't know yet. Uh, Andrew Lowood at Stanford is going to make some tests. I don't know, maybe he'll run them in microwaves or something like that. Some extreme conditions to find how fast bit rot occurs in the silicon uh, ROM chips. The ROM chips being the, the physical silicon entity which holds the, the data bit by bit. Um, it's estimated to be probably well above 100 years. What I mean by it's inevitable is that, well, Let's face it, we'll probably have uh, more chips than paper in the uh, distant future. And what they do, is they will transfer it to new hard drives, to new chips. So you need to transfer every couple of years, just like you would need to do with celluloid. Okay? Because celluloid uh, goes away fast, relatively, and they, they should, they're not, but they should be uh, you know, copying the films frequently. They're not, they're moving to digital, which is a an heresy, but that's another topic. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so the, the, the lifespan varies greatly, uh, and but the chip, the silicon, is not the worst support we've had to hold. The advantage is that we're both we're talking uh, contrarily to film, which passes from film to a digital format. Uh, when you're pa copying a chip from a chip, you're keeping the, the, the object more, it's more similar, let's say. Uh, the computers from in 100, 100 years from now, from now will be different, but the basic form of the storage uh, on a chip, a silicon chip, is likely to be used for a very, very long time. Yeah, you get less errors than when monks were copying the texts hand by hand. <laughs> yeah, um, before the last question, um, you were talking about information about the games, uh, and there was one website, there are game FAQs, which had, like, uh, for that, for ever, has had massive amounts of information about pretty much every single video game ever. But, like, I don't know like, how much more information there could be about the game stuff around there. Yeah, I think, I think what I was talking about more was this idea of, like, um, Games, at least historically for me, have always been this very personal experience. And, and we can store as much information about the games in, in terms of... Actually, someone just uh, published a book that just went up on Fan Gamer that's a, supposed to be a comprehensive exploration of Super Mario 3. Like, everything you ever needed to know, ever, about Super Mario 3. But one thing that doesn't tell me was um, sort, of, sort of the personal play experience, right? And, and that's why those things are really interesting to me, because uh, if you drew a map, and I drew a map, they're two very di they're going to be two very different maps, yeah. even though it's the same space. And I find that kind of stuff really interesting. Um, and there was a, there was an interesting project a few years ago that sort of tried to take that um, that idea of how we used to sit down and draw maps while we play games. And it's a Tumblr called Mapstalgia. And what it actually asked us to do was to draw video game maps from our childhood um, from memory. And then what people would do is they would scan them and then he would post them all. Uh, and they're fant it's, a, it's sort of a fantastic exploration of this idea, of, that's not how I remember it. I remember it this way. Um, and this idea of how we sort of encounter our own past as players 
uh, in, in sort of contemporary times and what that looks like. I always found that to be something that, that was really sort of interesting. And it's really fascinating to see what sticks after all these years, yeah. right? What stays in the mind yeah. of, of that experience. Any other questions? Thoughts? Comments? Uh, what about digitization? Um, basically, the, the other thing about having to digitize games is that uh, all the uh, all the console games that used to use cartridges are no longer, well, a lot of them are no longer functional. They used to use a battery to save the data, and now you can no longer do that for a lot of them because the battery's not working. <laughs> you, you can change the battery. So there's instructions online to do that, so you can uh, instill new life in those cartridges. The problem is then the console itself. And we live in the, you know, the, the buzzword of work right now is like a programmed obsolescence, right? Well, you could say that the, the first edition of the three, Xbox 360 was a little bit programmed to fail fast. And there's reasons in, in the capitalistic economy why that might be uh, you know, the case. And for historians, it's, it's hell. Um, the consoles are not going to last very long. So if we want to do the audiovisual archiving, it, it needs to be done fast, basically. And it needs a level of technical expertise on upkeep as well. Oh, yeah. um, the Computerspiel Museum in Germany is part of a, a collective uh, organization that's actually looking at how to archive um, both the physical and the immaterial aspects of, of computers and games. And they're looking at those questions, the questions of how do we keep these physical things operational so that we can actually exhibit them on their original platforms, but also how can we extend this idea of the archive and actually make sure the material isn't lost, and eventually those things are going to break down. They, they are. Um, the, the reality is that there won't be the types of chip that they're using right now to store the data, the ROMs, and the, the chips to process the programs are not going to be produced in, in 100 years. So when they fail, you won't find replacements. So if you don't find replacements, you know, Jimmy and his, his, his uh, and um, his basement won't be doing a chip by himself to replace it in a console. You need uh, an industrial industrial chain to create those chips, and we won't have that anymore. Those chips just won't be produced. Then you'll have the museum brought to you by Nintendo, just like I was talking about earlier. Um, any other final comments from our panelists? Anything you want to ask? Was there uh, well, just like, um, are you taking donations of material? <laughs> of course. Yeah. Say it to Always. Me. Yes. <laughs> I found, I found a uh, key card where I explained my dad was going on business in the late 90s how to install Doom and how to connect, <laughs> connect multiplayer Doom on a dial-up modem with him while he was on the road so I could say give him. And I threw it at this last weekend and it occurs to me that I could have given it to you. You could have. Yeah. See, this is the problem, right? Is there publicly available to donate these things? Is there like a... Maybe I should start a website that says, send me all your old weird game notes. Don't send them to me, you Yeah. Um, I'm going to have to get a bigger apartment now, moving here now, if, this, if I do something like that. We're developing a lab at the University of Montreal. We're restricted in terms of space, and so right now the goal is to give accessibility to the platforms and the games to the students who follow the, the, the video game related classes. Uh, but we do take games, consoles, donations. We have more than 45 platforms right now, more than 2,000 games. The, probably the best thing to do right now, since we're not in Europe and we the, the, we don't have access to that group that Scott mentioned, uh, is the Strong Museum of Play. Uh, like I said, there are 50,000 artifacts strong right now, and they, they have the space, they have the expertise. And they will take that other kind of stuff too, they are interested Sorry? in it. What's the name of that place? Again? The Strong Museum of Play. So. The, the website, is, I think, is iCheck.org, International Center for the History of Electronic Gaming. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Is it true that we were that when they say 60,000 physical artifacts, they actually count the small tokens in board games box? No, but that was a joke. I hope it's a joke, because I have 50,000 game artifacts myself. 